And now, please join us in welcoming the architect of the Forward Together Moral Movement, Reverend Dr. William Barber. Hello, Netroots. So good to be here. Let me say to all of the folk looking at my live stream back home in North Carolina, we say it like this. Say it with me. Forward together, not one step back. I'm literally just leaving to ask me Union Convention in Chicago <clears throat> and got on a plane to come straight here to be with this host of bloggers and social media experts. Everything I say today, blame it on Nolan Treadway. Where is he? <laughs> blame it on Nolan. There he is in the back. You know, I've been wondering why Nolan would extend an invitation to an old country boy like me. And I thought about <clears throat> this story about an old man who had a mule, and he entered the mule in the Kentucky Derby. And somebody saw him when he was entering it. He said, man, why would you enter that swayback mule into the Kentucky Derby? You know he can't win. And the man said, well, I know he can't win. That's not why I entered him. He said, the reason I've entered him because I thought the exposure might do him good. <laughs> so evidently, somebody thought the exposure might do us good. I want to talk today about a moral movement for the moral crisis is the only way to higher ground. Down in North Carolina, we in the Forward Together movement believe that we are in a moral crisis that is trying to take America down the road to political deconstruction. But there is a path to higher ground. There is a better way. To grasp why many of us believe we are in a moral crisis, we need to glance into history for a moment to find an interpretive lens. We need to understand, like this conference, the roots and the networkings of immoral deconstruction. And the only way to do that, we must find ourselves for a moment all the way back to the movement against slavery and the movement that was designed to deal with the vestiges of slavery. Remember, if you will, in the 1800s, 1868, there arose a movement to build a new South. It was called the Fusion Movement, the Moral Fusion Movement. And it led what was called the First Reconstruction. In that moment, in North Carolina, for instance, forging together, they created a path to higher ground by framing a vision of reconstructing the nation along our deepest moral values. Back then, 146 years ago, blacks and whites came together in the South, and they understood the fusion between lifting up the former slaves and how it intersected with the preservation of the South and the nation. Now, this reconstruction wasn't perfect, but walk with me for a minute and hear with me for a minute the kind of language they used to rewrite constitutions, to frame this movement and navigate the nation forward. Listen for a minute, if you will, at the language not used in 1960 or 1990 or 2000, but 146 years ago, for instance, in North Carolina. This is how 
black and whites were talking about coming up out of the vestiges of slavery. This is what they wrote in our Constitution. We the people of the, United, of the state of North Carolina, grateful to Almighty God, the sovereign ruler of nations for the preservation of the American Union and the existence of our civil, political, and religious liberties. Listen to what they said. We hold it to be self-evident that all persons are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of their own labor, and the pursuit of happiness. That's 146 years ago. That's language that didn't even make it into our Constitution federally. Then they wrote, Article 2, all political power is vested in and derived from the people and should be used only for the good of the whole. 146 years ago, they wrote, Section 10, all elections shall be free. 146 years ago, Section 11, all political rights and privileges are not dependent upon or modified by property. No property qualification shall affect the right to vote or hold off. 146 years ago, they knew how bad it was to let money drive who runs for political office. I'll back up some. The mic man told me to back up from the mic. I'm an old country preacher. You might have to just back off a little bit. But we'll work this out. Just stay with me. Section 12 said the people have a right to assemble. And then they said, but secret political societies are dangerous to the liberties of a free people. 146 years ago, they knew the danger of lobbyists that go into back rooms and dictate policy. Section 15, 146 years ago, they made education a constitutional right in the South. Public, the people have a right to pr public education, and the state must guard that right. Section 16 demanded that everybody be provided equal protection. Excuse me, Section 19, equal protection under the law. And then Article 11, 146 years ago, when blacks and whites built this fusion movement. They wrote this in the Constitution. Listen, Article 11, Section 4, beneficent provision for the poor, the unfortunate, and the orphan is one of the first duties of a civilized and Christian state. And we've got to be a little concerned if people had that much sense 146 years ago when we look at the state of our crisis today. In 1868, we see this moral, say moral, moral. fusion, fusion. Language. language. And it formed a framework for reconstruction. Here's what they fought for with this fusion movement. Voting rights, public education, labor, health care, equal protection, fair tax policy, good of the whole. And that kind of agenda reshaped the South and it reshaped the country. It reshaped the world. But it also brought a vicious backlash. A group came to being and they called themselves the Tea Party. I mean, excuse me, I'll get to that. I'm, help me, Lord, help me. I, I'm in 18, I'm in 18, I'm in 1868. I'm, I'm in 18, I'm in 1868. A group arose that called themselves the Redemption Movement. And it was re rooted in the extreme philosophy of immoral deconstruction. And they fought back. They were moved by fear. Fear that their world was being taken over. Fear of a more just society. Fear of a more perfect union. They were radical races and, and began a process of immoral deconstruction. They began a campaign of fear and divide. They called themselves heretically the redemption movement. Sounds nice, but what they meant by that was it's time for us to redeem America from the problem of black and white people working together for justice. Hmm? What did they attack first? Voting rights. Then they attacked public education. Then they attacked labor. Then they attacked fair tax policies. And then they attacked progressive leaders. And then they engaged in a plan uh, 400 and some years ago to take over the courts, 
state and federal, so that they could be used in the service of rendering rulings that undermined the hopes of a new America that ended with Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. And then they led riots all over this country and tried to make sure that certain elements had guns so that they could put the country back in its place according to their deconstructive, immoral philosophy. And from this history, my friends, we must understand the root of what we're seeing. We've learned, we learned that the strategy to stop any effort at reconstruction, the strategy to stop fusion movement has always consisted of these five or six direct attacks. You attack voting rights, you attack tax revenue and government programs and agencies designed to promote social uplift. You attack labor rights. You attack public education policy. You attack, uh, uh, and, you, and you attack or assassinate or, or try to undermine white and black progressive leaders. And then we get to the second reconstruction. I'm passing a lot of history, but bear with me. 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education decision had an indelible impact on the United States declared the case of the century. It established that intentional segregation was unconstitutional, and this ruling to served to fuel the civil rights movement. Two things fueled fuel the civil rights movement. The Brown decision and the acquittal of the people that killed Emmett Till. Because when Rosa Parks saw them be acquitted, it was then that she decided in response to the acquittal of the murderers of Emmett Till, she had to sit down and challenge the existing system of discrimination. So in 1954, we get the Brown decision. Just about a year later, August 28, 1955, you get the death of Emmett Till. <laughs> but both of these things result in the kind of creation of a second reconstruction, a new fuse, moral fusion politics. And what do we see with this new fusion of blacks and now whites and now women and now Latinos and now the LGBT community like Bayette Rustin and others all coming together? What did we see? We saw affirmative action. We saw the Committee on Equal Employment. We saw civil rights connected morally to economic justice. We saw the Social Security Amendments of 1965. We saw the creation on a moral basis of Medicare, Medicaid. We saw changes in the application of Social Security that allowed the domestic community and the agrarian community that had been left out in 1935. We saw the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65. And President Johnston said on August 6, 1965, that the Voting Rights Act was a triumph for freedom as huge as any victory that's ever been won on any battlefield. But the law came months after Martin Luther King launched the Southern Coalition, Southern, uh, Coalition Le Leadership Conference in Selma when all, people of all different faiths came together, all different colors, and demanded from a moral perspective that the nation needed to change. So this moral fusion politics gained tremendous ground in the Second Reconstruction. But then, as in the 1800s, the transformative power of moral-based fusion politics once again came under attacks. This time, the attacks were defined and developed by Kevin Phillips, a Nixon and Republican strategist. It came to be known as the White Southern Strategy. It was a strategy deliberately designed to play the race card in a way to drive Southern whites to vote, for, vote their fears and not their future. But it was designed to play the race card without seeming racist. You remember when GOP strategist Lee Atwater boldly described the Southern strategy? You all have seen it out on Google and everywhere. Well, he said, you know, we couldn't use the N-word anymore, not in 64, 65. He said, you can't be overtly racist. It'll backfire. So you say stuff like forced busing and states' rights and all that stuff, he said. And he said, you get abstract. You talk about cutting taxes and all these things you're talking about. They seem to be totally economic, and, but the byproduct of them is that blacks get hurt worse than whites, and we are able to divide the country. The target of the Southern strategy was all of the Southern states of the old Confederacy, but also some of the suburbs of the North. 
It was the goal of developing a solid South to ensure that the majority of Southern whites would resist and repeal any fusion political and moral alliances with African Americans and others. Programs that were once popular became the focus of great dislike and were castigated as negative entitlements, helping those undeserving people. Voting rights and civil rights laws were seen as further intrusion on the sovereignty of the state, especially in Southern states, and the process to no longer allow issues such as addressing poverty and civil rights to be defined in the public square as moral issues were begun in earnest with the goal of limiting the moral discourse in the public square to abortion, prayer in the school, and your stance on homosexuality. Even though those things do not even make up the primary or the preeminent ethical or moral concerns of any moral religion. Not one. Let's get to the root of this thing. Leaders of the progressive moral vision were attacked. Some were killed. Mega kill. Martin kill. Kennedy kill. Bobby kill. And the movement was depressed. And it worked. It solidified. And according to a recent article in the Times, Charles Koch in 1974 delivered a speech on how to build a massive infrastructure, not to promote particular candidates, but to recreate the social consciousness and to promote his brand of, of immoral deconstruction and how it would work. And Ronald Reagan used it to the T. In 1980, when he began part of his presidential campaign in Philadelphia, Mississippi, didn't have to be overtly racist, but he, he, by being there and by using all the code words of the, of the white Southern strategy, he locked up the South. So when we look at the ebbs and the flows and the lessons and the vision of these two periods, the first reconstruction and the second reconstruction, some of us believe that the current struggle before us now is a sign of the time, that we are in the middle of the struggle for a third reconstruction in this nation. That is why we see the same attacks we saw in the first Reconstruction and the second Reconstruction, the attack on voting rights, the attack on fair tax policy, the attack on public education, the attack on labor rights, the attack on women, the attack on LGBT rights, the attack on immigrants' rights. The attacks are a sign that we have the possibility of a third Reconstruction if we don't give up and understand what is at stake. We're in the middle. And how do I know again? It's because the movement in some ways was signaled by the 2008 election of President Obama. Now it wasn't so much the president, as powerful and as, as hopeful as we've been about that, but what signaled that we were in the possibility of a third reconstruction was the emergence of a new majority electorate, especially in southern states. North Carolina is now 23% African American, four, 3 to 4% Latino, that's 27%. That means you only need about 24% of whites to vote their future, not their fears. Mississippi is 33% African American, that means you, and you add Latinos, that means you only need about 15 to 16% of whites in the South in Mississippi to vote their future, not their fears. Similarly in Georgia. And the campaign of President Obama, not to be partisan but to be historical, used some of the elements of fusion politics that were used in the 1800s and in the 1960s. In North Carolina, before he ever ran, we had a movement, the Forward Together movement, that had already changed voting laws before he was on the ballot, that had won same-day registration and early voting and Sunday voting. We challenged even Democrats, and we won. And because of that, we opened up the possibility for a broad new electorate. And when President Obama won that state and won some southern states, that new electorate revealed the potential of a new fusion majority, one that directly challenges the white Southern strategy and that scares the daylights of those who want to stay stuck in the path. But watch what happened. In both the first and the second reconstruction, it took the extremists more than a decade to mount an effective reaction. 
with, the, with Obama's election and the electorate, the extremists said no, not just to him, but even before the man was inaugurated, they were saying no to the possibility of this new fusion politics. So now we have a political extremist, immoral deconstruction effort called by whatever name you want to call it, Tea Party, Coke Money Puppets, whatever you want to call it. It's an immoral agenda of re deconstruction. And every now and then, we need a few bloggers to tell them, y'all ain't fooling nobody. We know American history too well. And every now and then, we need to not, as my grandmother said, be so deep. But just explain what their agenda is and clear. Here, here's their agenda. Here's their agenda. This is their agenda. They, they are saying, these extremists, if you want a great America, here's the path to a great America. Deny public education and attack teachers undermine public funding of public education, give it to private schools. You want a great America? Here's the extremist view. Deny health care and Medicaid expansion. Leave millions of poor people uninsured. Deny earned income tax credit. Deny unemployment. Deny labor rights. Deny LGBT rights. Deny women's rights. Deny immigrants' rights and hold vicious rally against immigrant children when most of you come from immigrants yourself. Cut more taxes for the wealthy and then declare you don't have money for critical investments in America's infrastructure and in programs that uplift America. And then, here's their agenda. Say, say, tell your neighbor, say, this is their whole agenda. And whenever you know your agenda can't survive, if America really wants to be great, then, then engage in the worst form of voter suppression since Jim Crow. And then if you really want to have a great nation, tell every lie you can about the president, call him everything but an American and a child of God, refuse to pass anything just because you don't like little black girls having pajama parties in the White House. Come on here, let's expose it. Let's expose what's going on. Fight, help me a little bit, Mike, man. My voice is a little weak. Fight even his wife when she just wants children to eat healthy vegetables. And then, if you really want a great America, after you have flamed and, and blown on the fires of racial and class and national hatred, you want a really good America, make sure everybody can get a gun and make it easier to get a gun than to vote. That's their whole immoral deconstructionist agenda. But hear me. Now hear me on this. This kind of agenda can't just be challenged, however, with a mere left-right debate or conservative versus liberal debate, That's, that language is too puny. And I would humbly submit, not even just calling for a populist movement, because populist movement, especially in the South, have not always been on the side of progressivism. George Wallace was a populist movement. And populist movements have not always dealt adequately with race and class. Because populist movements tend to get caught up, is it race or class? When somebody asks me, is it race or class? I say, it is. <laughs> you really can't separate the two if you're gonna have transformational politics in America. And populist movements in the South have not always been willing to deal with labor rights. And so, for those of us who are rooted in the history of understanding American struggle with reconstruction, and we who are moved by the cries of our brothers and sisters, we know
that issues like justice and caring for the vulnerable and embracing the stranger and healing the sick and protecting workers and welcoming and being fair to all members of the human family and educating our children should never be relegated to the moral margins of our social consciousness. These are not just policy issues. These are not issues from, for some left-right debate. These are the centerpieces of our deepest traditions, of our faith, our values, and our sense of morality and righteousness. And in this moment, how do we think about building a moral movement? We must first start with the vision. What Walter Brueggemann calls a prophetic moral vision that seeks to penetrate the despair so that we can believe in and embrace new futures. This kind of vision does not ask at first if the vision can be implemented. Because questions of implementation are of no consequence until the vision can first be imagined. Where there is no vision, the people perish. You see, my brothers and sisters, another lesson from history. The slaves didn't get out of slavery by first figuring out how to get out. They got out by first knowing they needed to get out. And then they were driven by a vision that said, oh, freedom. Oh, freedom, and before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Their vision captivated them and penetrated the despair. And when the despair was penetrated, then they were able to implement ways to get out. And it's time for progressives and liberals, if you call that yourself, whatever you call yourself, to stop walking around in despair. It's time to fight back and stand up. If we're going... If we're going to have a real moral movement that can challenge the efforts at deconstruction in this country, we have to reinstate imagination that is not driven not by pundits, but by a larger vision. I get so tired of folks sitting on TV talking about what's possible in the South, and they don't even live in the South. I get so tired of people talking about what can't happen. You don't know what can happen until you get together and start organizing and start fighting back. Dr. King said that most of the time your greatest vision comes in the midst of your darkest night. And moral fusion movements don't build when everything is fine. Moral fusion movements are, is a form of dissent that always rises up when things are bad and dares to say there is a better way that we are all connected, that there's a moral way. And we must remind those who make decisions regarding public policy that there are some moral values that, are, that can guide us and can capture the imagination of people all over this nation. One of them is the values of the prophets, like my Jewish friends would tell you in Isaiah 10, where it says simply this, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make children and women their prey. That's why I tell my progressive friend, y'all stop throwing away the Bible. There's too much good stuff in there. <laughs> oh, there's another great question that, you could, that we ought to be using when we shape public policy. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was sick, did you give me health insurance? That's in the book. Whether you believe in Jesus eternally, you ought at least believe in him historically because Jesus' first sermon said to preach good news to the poor. And the word there is patokos. It's a Greek word, which means preach, preach good news to those who have been made poor by the social structures that create their poverty in the first place and give them the courage to stand up against it. Our deepest... Our deepest moral traditions declare that the true challenge to society is not private charity, but public policy that impacts how people exist every day of their lives. We need, we need a recovery of moral dissent 
the kind of moral descent that Henry David Thoreau said had. When somebody asked him one day during slavery, would he repent of his actions, of going to jail and challenging things, and David Thoreau said, the only thing I'm going to repent of is my good behavior in the face of such injustice. And then I'm going to ask myself, what demons possess me to be so quiet when so much wrong was going on? We need the recovery of the kind of moral descent. Like Martin Luther King, 46 years ago, in one of his last sermons, he said, if you ignore the poor, then one day the whole system will collapse and implode. And we, we need the kind of moral dissent that says every time we deny living wages and hurt teachers and undermine public education and suppress the right to vote, it costs us too much. It damages our, the soul of our democracy. We must step back into history and bring to the forefront again the kind of moral call, let's see, Teddy Roosevelt had, good Republican, when he said that the four moral issues of public policy ought to be labor, education, environmental justice, and voting. Yeah, we ought to lift up what Eisenhower said when he said that, that public education was a matter of national security. We ought to lift up what President Johnson said about the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the war on poverty, that these were the great moral issues. We need the kind of moral thinking that caused my parents in 1965, 66, to leave Indiana and go back to the South, give up a middle-class lifestyle, went down to, didn't have protected voting rights. They, they understood what they were going back to, but because of this vision, they left to go back in the South to help integrate public schools. My father is dead now, my mother is alive, she's 81 years old, she goes to work every day at the school she desegregated. When she went there, they called her the N-word, now they call her Miss Barber. We need a recovery of the kind of moral vision that says we'll walk across the Edmunds Pettus Bridge, young and old and black and white and Catholic and Jew and Christian, even in the face of, of all kinds of odds. We don't have the money, we don't have the votes, but if we walk, possibly we can change the consciousness of the country. We need the kind of, we need to recover. The first moral principle of our Constitution, it's not freedom. Not freedom. I get so bothered every time politicians run for office, some of them, you ask them, what are you going to do? Freedom. Why are you against Medicaid expansion? Freedom. Why, why are you against tax, why are you for tax cuts to the West? Freedom. Just freedom, 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 freedom. They haven't even read their own constitution. The first moral principle of our constitution is the establishment of justice. We need to reclaim the moral concern of that great prayer, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. We need the kind of clear moral perspective that Otto Schwammer often speaks of when he said, that the, the, the economist at MIT that I had a moment to study with, he said, we have a blind spot in our economic theory today. It's called conscience. We need the recovery of the kind of clear moral response that the Pope used the other day when Rush Limbaugh suggested he was a communist and he didn't study. The Pope said right back to Mr. Rush, you don't know what communism is. Declaring and for the poor, helping the poor, uplifting the poor is not communism, it's the heart of the gospel. We need the kind of language that's not left or right or conservative or liberal, but moral, fusion language that says, look, it's extreme and immoral to suppress the right to vote. It's extreme and immoral to deny Medicaid for millions of poor people, especially people who have been elected to office and then get insurance because simply they've been elected. It's extreme and immoral to raise taxes on the working poor by cutting earned income taxes and to raise taxes on the poor and middle class in order to cut taxes for the wealthy. It's extreme and immoral to use power to cut off poor people's water in Detroit. Just immoral. What we need to cut off is that kind of abusive power. 
It's extreme and immoral to end unemployment for those who have lost jobs or no fault of their own. It's extreme and immoral to resegregate our schools and underfund our public schools. It's extreme and immoral for people who came from immigrants to now have a mean amnesia and cry out against immigrants and the rights of children. It's mean, it's immoral, it's extreme to kick hardworking people when they're down. That's not just bad policy. It's against the common good and a disregard for human rights. It's a refusal to lean toward the angels of our better selves. In fact, this kind of philosophy rooted in the premises of immoral deconstruction, if you look at them carefully, they are historically inaccurate, they are constitutionally inconsistent, they are morally indefensible, and they are economically insane. And so our job, we must reclaim the moral center and shift the center of political gravity. Because in policy and politics in America, we face two choices. One is the low road to political destruction, and the other is the pathway to higher ground. And so my friends, in this Kairos moment in history, right now, right here, we've been called together to fight against a dangerous agenda of extreme. I didn't know any of you all before today, but the spirit of the times has called us together to stand against the dangerous agenda of extremism, the ultra-conservative right wing that is choosing the low road. That's what those who gave America its two greatest periods in the Reconstruction did. And I believe deep within my being, there is a longing for a moral compass. I know it to be so. Because in North Carolina, we found out that in this moment, we need a transformative moral fusion movement that's indigenously led, state-based, deeply moral, deeply constitutional, anti-racist, anti-poverty, pro-justice, pro-labor movement that brings people together, that doesn't wait for somebody to rescue you out of Washington, D.C., but you mobilize from the bottom up. <laughs> Movements never came from D.C. down. Movements always come from Montgomery up, from Birmingham up. And we need to build for the long term, not just around one issue or one campaign. We need to stop looking for a Messiah candidate and build a movement. We need a deeper language that gets into people's souls and pulls them into a new place. Labor rights are not left or right issues. Women's rights are not left or right issues. Education is not a left or right issue. Helping people when they're unemployed is not left or right. Those issues are the moral center of who we are. And it's high time that we recover the moral dialogue in this nation. <laughs> not only that, we, we progressives need a movement where our relationship with our coalition partners are transformative, not transactional. You know, we sometimes like those movements where everybody signs that I'm with the movement, but they're really with those, their issue. But what we've got to have is a movement, and we've learned this in North Carolina, that understands the connectivity between the issue, where each partner, yes, embraces your issue, but you also embrace the other issues because you understand the intersectionality. Let me make it plain for you. The reality is, the greatest myth of our time is that extremist policies only hurt a small subset of people, such as people of color, or women, or poor, or the LGBT community, when in fact, they hurt us all. So we need the kind of coalition where education advocates stand for education, but they also stand up for LGBT rights. Where healthcare advocates stand up for healthcare, but they also stand up for labor rights where labor rights people, yes, stand for labor rights, but they also stand up for civil rights. Why? Because we understand that these Tea Party type extremists, they are against us all. The same people that fight labor rights and that fight women's rights. And the same people that fight women's rights fight LGBT rights. And the same people that fight LGBT fight, fight uh, working rights. And the same people that fight workers' rights, they fight health care rights. And the same people that fight health care rights, they fight immigrants' rights. If they are together and we are not together, who's the fool? And then we need a language that believes that people can be redeemed. 
So in North Carolina, we are black, we are white, we are Latino, we are Native American, we are Democrat, we're Republican, we're independent, we're people of all faith, people not of faith who believe in a moral universe, we're natives, we're immigrants, we're business leaders and workers and unemployed, we're doctors and uninsured, we're gay, we're straight, we're students and we're parents and we're retirees and we all stand together to lift up and defend the most sacred moral principle of our faith, our constitutional values and who we are. That's what a fusion coalition does. But not only that, we must challenge the position and the hypocrisy, especially in the South, of the religious right. And we don't do it by castigating religion. When you want to challenge the religious right, you need to find a good conser religious conservative like me. Oh, I know that language messed y'all up. But let me tell you why I'm a religious conservative. You see, in the Bible I read, I read this book, carry it with me, called the Poverty and Justice Bible, and it has all the scriptures marked in it that deal with justice and uplift of the poor and helping women and children. And, and in that Bible is 2,000 scriptures that are marked. Now, I've looked at the religious rights agenda about being against people who are homosexual and being, against, uh, being for prayer in the school and being against abortion, and, and I can find about five scriptures that may speak to those issues, and four of them they misinterpret. And none of them ever trump this ethical demand that you love your neighbor as yourself. And that you do justice and you love mercy. So what you need to challenge the religious right is not somebody to go on MSNBC or CNN and say, I don't have anything to do with that and I just don't like, but that you need somebody who is a person of faith to challenge the hypocrisy of faith and say to the religious right, you really want a moral debate? Bring it on, baby, bring it on. Bring it here. Because I want to know how you claim to be a conservative when conservative means to hold on to the essence of. So how are you a conservative if you talk the least about what God talks about the most and the most about what God talks about the least? But not only that, as I move toward my conclusion, we must have a movement that brings together a diverse coalition that is rooted in hope and not fear. You know, I'm getting tired of going to all these conferences. I told Roz Pellis this the other day, and we got to get in the room with those blue, green, and red dots, y'all know. And everybody wants to sit in and figure out what the agenda is while the other folk are taking action. We ought to know what the agenda is to a great America by now. Let me tell you the agenda that's pulled us together in North Carolina. One, securing pro-labor, anti-poverty policies that ensure economic sustainability. Two, educational equality by ensuring every child receives a high-quality, well-funded, constitutional, diverse public education and access to colleges and community colleges. Number three, health care for all by ensuring access to the Affordable Care Act, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, and providing environmental protection for all communities. Number four, fairness in the criminal justice system by addressing the continuing inequalities in the system and providing equal protection under the law for black, brown, and poor white people. And number five, protecting and expanding voting rights, women's rights, LGBT rights, immigrants' rights, and the fundamental principle of equal protection under the law. If we can't organize around that agenda, then I'm wondering what's wrong with us. But that agenda, intersectionally, morally, has pulled us together. But then we got to mobilize in the streets. Somebody say in the streets. Say at the polls and in the courtroom and in the legislative halls. So we've come up with 12 steps that we believe we need to have embraced in every state. Number one, build an indigenously led grassroots organizing across the state. Number two, use moral language to frame and critique public policy through our deepest moral and constitutional values, regardless of who's in power, Democrat or Republican. 
Number three, demonstrate a commitment to civil disobedience that follows the steps of the movement that is designed to change the public conversation and consciousness. Number, number four, build a stage from which to lift the voices, not of politicians, but of everyday people impacted by immoral extremist policy. Number, number six, build a coalition of moral and religious leaders of all faith. Number seven, intentionally diversify the movement with the goal of winning unlikely allies. Number seven, build a transformative long-term coalition relationship rooted in a clear agenda that doesn't measure success just by electoral outcomes and destroys the myths of extremism. Then make a serious commitment to academic and empirical analysis of policy because the worst thing you can do as an activist is to be loud and wrong. And then finally, next, use social media coordination in all forms, video, text, Twitter, Facebook. Then engage in voter registration and voter education and voter participation. And then pursue a strong legal strategy so that you have lawyers that take the, what the movement bubbles up into the courtrooms and fight based on our Constitution. And then the last one, resist the one moment mentality and say we are not here to have a moment. We are trying to build a movement. And so my friends, that's what we started building seven years ago and I wanted to say that at Netroots, don't ever think the Forward Together Mall movement just happened overnight. Seven years ago, when Democrats went office, and by the way, you can't have a mall movement if you aren't willing to criticize both parties. Seven years ago, we began what is now known as the Forward Together Mall movement. And when Tom Tillis and Berger and McCory, the leaders of extremism in North Carolina, the Speaker of the House, the Senate leader and the governor, after gerrymandering and gerrymandering the redistricting process in 2010, aided by North Carolina's own Koch brother, Art Pope, and they stole the election and gained a supermajority, they thought they had smooth sailing. <laughs> they thought that their deconstruction, divide and conquer immoral agenda would just run by a course and we would just be depressed and go home to the next election. But they had to meet us who know our history, who care about the soul of our democracy and who know how to fight back and move forward. And I'm here to tell you that when you call people together to fight on issues of moral principle rather than party, it works. Listen to me. We started Moral Monday. They said we were morons. Governor McCory used the same language George Wallace used in 1963 to describe us. He said we were outsiders. But we said to the extremists who ignore the common good, the more you try to push us down, the more we're going to push forward. The more you try to depress us, the more you will inspire us. Maybe we asked them a question. Maybe you don't know what the great psalmist said in Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected have now become the chief cornerstone and a new movement is happening right here in your face. We said to them, make no mistake, this is no mere, hyper, mere hyperventilation or partisan pouting. No, this is a fight for the future and the soul of our state. And it doesn't matter what you call us, what matters is what we answer to. But we also learned another power of moral fusion progressive movement in the 21st century. And that is, they can deride us they can deflect from the issue, but they can't debate us. They can't debate us when we make our case on moral and constitutional ground. They call us whiners. Tillis called us who's running for the Senate. He called us whiners and losers and leftists, and some of them called us socialists. But we say to them, if we are leftists in fighting for justice and fairness and all people, then the Bible and the Constitution are the Magna Carta of leftist documents. Oh, they're mad with us. Because how do you cut 500,000 people's Medicaid, for instance, and then declare it's the moral thing to do? It doesn't work. So all you can do is deride us. And that's why we also refuse to call them Republicans. Touch your neighbor and say, we got to be disciplined now. See, we don't call them Republicans, not, not in the moral movement. My, first of all, I can't call them good Republicans because my granddaddy was one of them, as were most black people in the early 1900s. But he wasn't this kind of extremist. Abraham Lincoln, who stood for equality and justice, was a Republican, but he wasn't this kind of extremist. 
Black and white Republicans in the 1800s expanded voting rights in the first Reconstruction, but they weren't this kind of extremist. Teddy Roosevelt was a Republican, but he called health care and for minimum wage and, and, and environmental protection as moral issues. Dwight Eisenhower, you heard me tell you, believed that in the public education. We know good Republicans, black Republicans like Edward Brooks and Ralph Bunch and Benjamin Hooks, the past president of the NAACP, championed the cause of freedom and justice and stood up against extremists of their time. Even Ronald Reagan had some moments. <laughs> Ronald Reagan supported the earned income tax credit, so we say to Governor McCory, Tillis, and Berger, when you cut earned income tax credit, you make Ronald Reagan look like a liberal. You must be extreme. It was Republicans and Democrats who called trickle-down tax policy voodoo economics. And so we say to them, you're not being good Republicans. As one lady stood up in Idea County recently in her 80 years old and took the mic from me in a, sir, in a, on, at a speech and said, Reverend Bob, let me say something. I had never been interrupted during a sermon. <laughs> she said, I'm a nine-generation Republican, and I'm sick and tired of these extremists hijacking our party. And then after she said that, I said, you know, the truth is, this place we're in right now in America is not about Republicans versus Democrats. It's not about liberals versus conservatives. It's about right versus wrong. It's about extremism versus the more noble vision of our Constitution. And I'm here to tell you, my God, have we seen the power of building a fusion movement the power of picking up the plow of justice one more time. We started with 17 of us, Ross, last year, after seven years of building, we've been gathering thousands of people every year, but after this extreme takeover, and after they decided to gut voting rights on Monday, Thursday, during Easter week, 17 of us during the season of Pentecost, went in to the General Assembly, they brought out all these cops, they arrested us, they even arrested a woman who had, who had cerebral palsy, but when they did it, I said, it's on now. And we've now been at this 64 straight weeks, over 120 actions. If you count the seven years before, we've been at it eight years. In February, in the dead of winter, we saw 80,000 plus people show up, the largest gathering for justice in the South since Selma. We now, have seen young people engaged like never before. We now have Moral Freedom Summer Program where 40 young people are organizing in 50 counties to register and inspire 50,000 new registered voters by August. We've seen 1,004 people arrested, the most people arrested at a state house ever in the history of the South for civil disobedience, representing the full fabric of North Carolina's population. We have over 1,000 clergy engaged of every faith and every denomination, labor unions and civil rights and women and LGBTQ and immigrant and environmentalists are working together like never before. We have made a state issue a national issue. We've inspired similar movements in, in almost nine other states and growing because we built a movement in not a moment. When we started, the governor was at 50% in the poll and called us outsiders, but now he's at 30% in the polls and falling after 64 weeks. When we started, the legislature was at 40% in the poll and now they're at 17% and falling. When we started, most of the issues we supported were not above 50%. But now, after shifting the consciousness and engaging a moral narrative with a faith, 55% of North Carolinians oppose re uh, refusing U.S. aid for the long-term jobless and the unemployed. 55% of North Carolinians now support raising the minimum wage. 58% of North Carolinians now should say we should accept federal funds to expand Medicaid. 61% of North Carolinians now oppose using public funds for vouchers to support private schools. 54% of North Carolinians now would rather raise taxes to give teachers a, a pay raise than to cut taxes. 55% of voters in North Carolina oppose the General Assembly uh, plan to cut personal and corporate taxes 
66% of North Carolinians now don't agree with the North Carolina legislature's strict limits on women's reproductive rights. Only now, only 33% agree with cutting pre-K and child care aid. 77, not 23%, not even one in four agree with repealing the Racial Justice Act. 73% now favor outlawing discrimination against gays in hiring and firing. And 68% of voters now oppose cutting early voting and ending straight ticket voting. And 68% favor an alternative to voter ID. I'm telling you, a moral vision works. And my friends, that's not even, the numbers don't even tell the story. Right now, there's a Republican mayor named Adam O'Neill that's joined the movement and uh, fighting for Medicaid expansion. He's walking 273 miles to Washington, D.C. He's taking on Pat McCrory and Tillis and saying that Republicans should be ashamed of themselves for, I mean, excuse me, extremists should be ashamed of themselves for denying Medicaid expansion. You don't see that kind of coming together until you have a moral movement. A few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, we were invited to Mitchell County. Mitchell County is 99% white, 89% Republican. They said years ago we could never organize in Mitchell County. But a few months ago, we went up, we were invited to Mitchell County. And I'm here to tell you, we went up there with this moral agenda. We found out that Mitchell County and up in the mountains, there's not a lot of difference between mountain populism and civil rights activism. We found out that people in the mountains need labor rights and need unemployment and need health care and need public education. And now the Republican chair of the party renounced the party and resigned because he said it's been taken over by extremism. Now in Mitchell County, we have a branch of the NAACP and we've never had one there in the history of the country and it's the most diverse branch of the NAACP anywhere. I'm telling you, it works. And I tell this story everywhere I go. The only problem I have about those folk up in Mitchell County and those mountain people, they are some radical people. When I was up there, it was nighttime. And after I finished speaking, they asked me, they said, Reverend Bobby, will you lead us on a march? I said, march where? They said, we want to march on the Tea Party extremist legislator's house to tell him how much we disagree with him. I said, wait a minute, white people. I said, I'm all about marching, but y'all started that marching at night. Black folk don't march at night, but you call, but you call a march in the daytime and we'll be there. So we called a march in Asheville and 10,000 people showed up in the mountain. Oh, I wish I had time, Ross. I wish I had time to tell y'all the story when 93-year-old Rosa Nair Eaton joined this moral movement, came out one day and said, I'm leading the crowd today to civil disobedience. 93 years old. She was forced to read the preamble of the Constitution, recite it, when the person asking her to recite it couldn't read it themselves. She came tomorrow Monday, grabbed the hand of another 93-year-old white woman, threw down their walker, led 150 people in the General Assembly to get arrested for civil disobedience, stood up to the powers that be. Now she's the lead plaintiff in our case against voter suppression in North Carolina. I'm telling you, it works. A few weeks ago, some people led a sit-in, part of the movement in Tom Tillis's office. And what happened was amazing. The sit-in was there, there's a young lady named Crystal. She has cervical cancer. She needs Medicaid expansion. She can't get it because they've denied it in North Carolina. But they sat in with Crystal. Who sat in with her? A black young Muslim? Who sat in with her? A white preacher that had pastors an openly welcoming community? And an African-American mother who's a leader in organizing? 
and also some African-American males and a 78-year-old woman from Iredell County, which is one of the most extreme, regressive counties in our state. They came together and sat in that office for 12 hours and demanded that they be heard. That's what can happen. That's the kind of community that can happen when you build a moral movement. And so my friend, those of us who believe in freedom, we're being called now to ride, raise up a fresh moral movement. I know I've taken a little time, but these are not easy issues. The day is over for quick political platitudes. The day is over for little campaign slogans. We've got to build a movement. We've got to think deeper. And it's going to take more than a few texts and a few emails. We must engage in action that shifts the center of political gravity in this nation. And we've got to do it state by state. And we've got to say, no matter who's in Congress or who's in the General Assemblies of our state or who's in the Governor's Mansion or who's in the White House, we are demanding higher ground. And we've got to say, you don't have enough political power to vote us away. You don't have enough insults to talk us away. And to the Koch brothers, you don't have enough damn money to buy us away. That's why, that's why we've taken more Monday on the road now. And now in North Carolina, it's tomorrow march to the polls. And every Monday, we're joining, and we invite you to come on down. That's why on August the 21st through the 28th, in North Carolina, we're calling for seven days of activism at the state capitol that will be combined with voter registration and, yes, civil disobedience, where we will continue to expose the extreme immoral agenda. And we hope that our seven days will inspire other states. Because, you know, Dr. King never told us to go back to D.C. Go back and read the speech. He said, go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to Georgia. In other words, go back to the states and build up a state movement. What if we could get all of the southern states to join together for seven days? What if we could get environmentalists and healthcare advocates and civil rights advocates and labor and, and, and voting rights advocates and women and LGBT to walk together for seven days? Seven days of unity, seven days of protest, seven days of changing the dialogue, seven days of tweeting, seven days of Googling, seven days of emailing. What would happen in this country? And on the seventh day, we marched around seven times and then sat down in the state capitol and and said, we will be heard. Oh, let me go to my seat, but I stopped by to tell you, we can't give up on this vision now. Not now, not ever. Martin is not gonna get up out of the grave. Mega's not gonna get up out of the grave. Rosa's not going to get up out of the grave. Cesar Chavez is not going to get up out of the grave. Vio Luisa from Detroit is not going to get out of the grave. Ann Brayton is not going to get out of the grave. Ella Baker is not going to get out of the grave. But we are their children, and we are here right now, and it's our time. It's our time. It's our time. Tell your neighbor, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, we will never abdicate our birthright and sell it to the highest bidder. It's our time. It's our time. It's our time. And we're on our way to higher ground. Oh, God. Let me, can I be a preacher for three minutes? My son is an environmental physicist, and every now and then he tells me things about nature. And he told me one day, he said, Daddy, if you ever get lost in mountainous territory and you have to walk out, don't walk out through the valley, but climb up the mountain to higher ground. 
I said, why must I climb up the mountain to higher ground? He said, daddy, snakes live in the lowland. But if you go up the mountain, there's something in biology and environmental studies called a snake line. Snakes can't live above it because they asphyxiate, they suffocate, they're cold-blooded animals, and they die. Well, in America, we've got to get our politics above the snake line. Have mercy, Jesus. Yeah. There are some snakes out here. There are some low-down policies out here. There's some poison out here. Going backwards on voting rights, that's below the snake line. Going backwards on civil rights, that's below the snake line. Hurting people just because they have a different sexuality, that's below the snake line. Stomping on poor people just because you got power, that's below the snake line. Denying health care to the sick and keeping children from opportunity, that's above, below the snake line. But I stop by to tell you, there's got to be somebody that's willing to go to higher ground. Higher ground where every child is educated. Higher ground where the sick receive health care. Higher ground where the poor are lifted. Higher ground where voting rights are secure. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, we've got to take America above the snake line. Yes, we are. Yes, we can. Yes, we will. America is better than this. It's time to go above the snake line. Now, I must confess, I'm not a good tweeter. I can't build a blog. But would y'all join me in my form of communication? Stand on your feet like we say in church. Give your neighbor a high five and say, we're on our way to higher ground, higher ground, higher ground. It's our time. And when I go up in the spirit and I listen to the Lord sometime, I'm reminding that the moral arc of the universe, it might be long, but it bends toward justice. Every now and then when I'm up there on the higher ground, I hear the Lord say, if God be for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. Every now and then when I'm up there in the stratosphere, up there in the spirit, up there in the higher place, I hear the Lord say, weeping may endure for a night. Tea parties may endure for a night. Coke brother may endure for a night. Oppression may endure for a night. But hang in there. Make your way to higher ground because joy still comes in the morning. I hear the prophet Isaiah say, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings as eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. And for those of you that haven't been to church lately, as amen goes right there. Tell somebody, we're on our way. We're on our way. We're on our way to higher ground. Forward together. Forward together. Forward together. Not one step 